Hi, Hi Mickey. Mickey. Hey, Bob. It doesn't look like you've changed your clothes lately. No, that's because this is the second half of our previous dialogue. You're right. We wound up taping so long that we just decided to cut it into two dialogues. And this is the second half. Um, and we're wearing the same clothes. And we saved the best stuff for the second half. We always do that. Because that's when the, the caffeine kicks in. Did we? I don't think so. But anyway. Um, we'll see. Okay. So anyway, we've accomplished our mission. And now they will see a slightly discon uh, discontinuous little, like, glitchy thing. And then the dialogue will start in the middle of the conversation. Okay. Great. Nice, nice talking to you. See ya. See ya. But, um, so... It, in this Leslie Gelb article you had me read about the beating the drums for war with Iran yeah. uh, was very annoying because he mocks the neocons for beating the drums for war with Iran, which I understand, but he never says what he would want to do with respect to Iran and whether he is willing to ha let Iran get the bomb, Right. Uh, which I thought was pretty irresponsible. Well, he doesn't have to address guys. it. Um well, why, you don't want to mock these people. It's not fair to mock these people if they have the only solution. Well, you can mock Bill Crystal, who was saying we should have responded to that alleged Saudi assassination plot by bombing Iran. Yeah. The, the most hilarious thing was in the Republican debate when the Republicans were saying, we should have a secret plan, which we don't tell anybody, to destabilize the Iranian regime and sabotage their nuclear facilities. Well, of course, we obviously do have such a plan. We're doing... You know, we are doing right. it, and we're not telling anybody. That's why we don't know about it. Right. I, so I it's mean, like a, an absurd thing for you know, In fact, I mean, I think uh, the war with Iran may be starting now, okay? Like, yesterday, there was a mysterious explosion in an Iranian city that happens to process uranium. And a couple of weeks ago, there was a mysterious explosion in an Iranian missile-like uh, facility that happened to kill the person who was apparently in what? charge on the military side of the ballistic missile program. There was and, an interesting... Go ahead. Well, no, go, go ahead. I mean, right. we, there, and, we either, you know, presumably Israel, but with our tacit, uh, possibly actual operational support, certainly tacit endorsement, is committing a series of acts of war. They, they've assassinated a couple of nuclear scientists, um, leaving aside the Stuxnet thing, which we seem to have participated in. Um, you know, these are acts of war. And... Uh, and it's looking like Iran is maybe starting to respond in subtle ways. Today, there was a storming of the Iranian embassy. Uh, the British which embassy. Seems to have been, I mean, of the British embassy in Iran. Uh, I, I think yesterday, some missiles went from Lebanon into Israel. Uh, and, you know, I... But don't you think it's better to have a low-level war uh, with, with slowly escalating than have a initially start off with... Strikes. Not if you wind up in the same place. I would imagine that Israel would welcome. Well, you the, wind it up. Well, you wind up there organically, Bob. Oh, that's a lot better. The the um, well, no no pesticides. Do you have, I, I like, you have a I like war with, with no war? pesticides, Mickey. Do you have a problem with the war with Iran if it takes out the nuclear totally. facilities and ushers in a democracy? Ushers in a democracy. <laughs> Is that what you think it would do? I mean, or even if it takes out the nuclear so facilities, so wait, you're, the you're same proposing you're proposing not just a bombing strike to take out the nukes, which you know, probably can't be done in any enduring way, but regime change should be the goal, too? Well, I'm just saying, what, it, 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 you know, it, having, having a military confrontation with Iran, if, if we do accomplish our goals, is not such a horrible thing. Oh, I think it is a horrible thing. Uh, I mean, first of all, don't, it, it's, it's, it, most people who think about these things say it's pretty unlikely that it would be some kind of surgical bombing strike. In any event, you don't seem to anticipate well, that because you're envisioning you're envisioning regime change. I mean, the effect of the bombing strike is to empower the authoritarians and not to aid the cause of democracy, okay? That is predictable. So you got to kind of make up your mind. I mean, if you want some sort of land assault that deposes the regime and you haven't learned your lesson from Iraq and Afghanistan, then, you know, good luck. But which, which is it that you're proposing here? A bomb? Uh, no, I'm just saying you can't. You can't say this is so horrible because it ends in the same place. That's all. The same place. Well, I, I'm saying. Well, well. It might be good to end in the same place. If well, we're I don't not think it's good to end in the same place. I'm know? not in favor of war with Iran, and I don't think we have a right 
you know, I, I don't think our nuclear non-proliferation policy is uh, sufficiently um, equitable and and uh, to 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 warrant this. I mean, the, the the proliferation regime we would be defending if we bombed Iran to keep them from having a, a nuclear weapon. First of all, is a regime in which our friends get nukes, yours don't. Okay. Because, I mean, remember, Iran could, could drop out of the, of the non-proliferation treaty tomorrow and then announce down the road that they've got nukes, and their legal status in international law would be the exact same as Israel, Pakistan, and India. And all three of those cases, we, we were fine with them having nuclear weapons because they, they were our allies, okay? So, well, or, or else they're stable and predictable. Oh, Pakistan's stable and predictable? Well, to the extent they're not, we don't like it. Well, well, well look, to do with them being so look, friendly, they're not of, so friendly. I mean, they may seem stable and predictable to us, but if Russia you, has nukes. They weren't our friend, but they were. But they were. You know, we could sort of deal with them. Well, they may seem stable and predictable to us, um, but but if you ask what Israel looks like to the Arab world and the Iranians, it looks like a country with a history of disproportionate response, which is you know, uh, military grossly disproportionate response in terms of level of, of destruction wrought relative to the initial provocation. And if I were an Arab or an Iranian, I might think, hmm, not so great for a country well, so you're willing to, like that to have you, nukes. You, you, would, you know, you'd rather have global Armageddon in order, as opposed to have an unfair nuclear proliferation I think regime. war with Iran is more likely to lead to global Armageddon than Iran having nukes. You know? The, There's no the, reason to think that the people who would actually control the nukes in Iran would be suicidal, okay. which is what they would have to be to actually use the nuclear weapons. Well, there's plenty of reason to believe it because they believe in martyrdom and et cetera, et cetera. There's, there are reasons to Wait, Osama that, bin Laden believes. It's not like there's Osama no bin Laden to it. believes in martyrdom, but did you see him willingly sack? I think we had to kind of track him down. I don't think he committed suicide. The world is full. You just said there was no evidence, and I'm saying belief in martyrdom is some evidence. Mickey, maybe not, Mickey maybe not Christian, leaders, evidence, Christian leaders believe that they're going to heaven when they die. Does that make it dangerous that they have nukes? They don't go on TV and talk about it. <clears throat> well, either they believe it or they don't. <laughs> oh, the, and, and, the way Ahmed you know, has. The, the, the world is full of leaders who encourage other people to commit suicidal acts, either military or terroristic or whatever. It is a reliable fact. That the people who got to be leaders in the first place do not themselves want to die. And there's, so there's no more reason to worry about Iran than worry about any other country requiring nukes. Not appreciably, no, no. Yeah, Jesus. Um, I, there, there's a pretty. Good... Well, go ahead and make the case. What, what are you afraid of? Who do you? Th who is suicidal there? I don't, I'm afraid of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of them be willing to pay a very high price to wipe Israel off the map. That's what we're we'll worried about. I think. A very high price in the sense of wanting to die and their whole families to die and all their friends Being to die? Being willing to sacrifice a lot of their own lives, yes. Well, not a That's lot. Cool. We're talking them. We're talking the person who makes the decision and their entire family and all their friends and their, and their nation. Who, who do you think really, really wants that in Iran? The, 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 it's, it's definitely certain that a retaliatory strike would wipe out the leadership? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, Israel has like a couple hundred nukes, and I'm sure if they didn't do the job, you would see some follow-up on the ground. Hmm. Uh, I don't know if follow-up on the ground is going to do the, going to wipe out the elites. The elites tend to escape. The um, there was a pretty good article, pretty good post in on Hot Air of all yeah. places. Probably a site you don't go to much. I don't. Uh, it's a, a Michelle Malkin's former site. It's a right-wing site pointing out that it's unlikely that the second blast you talked about in Isfahan mm -hmm. was part of a covert strategy because uh, Isfahan only turns yellow cake into a higher grade uranium, which then goes down the road to a facility where it's processed into weapons grade uranium. Mm -hmm. So you're intervening pretty low down on the mm -hmm. chain. Mm -hmm. They already have enough weapons grade uranium to make nuclear bombs. Uh, so, and and also, if you if you really blew up the site, it would cause massive contamination. Uh, so uh, they thought it was more likely that it was an internal rebellion. In other words, some some internal Iranian group 
And maybe this well, is misinformation. Yeah. <clears throat> that, of course, is uh, the kind of meme that hot air would push. That, oh, it just takes, you know, regime changes in the air. It just Let's just get Ahmed Chalabi to helicopter no. in. He'll take care no, of the rest. Be, but it, no, because it's obviously a futile, I mean, if it didn't blow up the, the plan, it would be a sort of futile gesture. Yeah. But it could be, it could be disinformation, in other words. You know, we really did it, but we're trying to say that it was internal opponents that did it. Yeah. But it's it's not the likeliest target, as opposed to to get to killing this guy who was actually building ICBMs. Right. Uh, That's the, the thing. The first one you talked right. about. Right. This one does not take out a crucial yeah. component in their now, ability re to deliver a bomb. Reports are very sketchy about the thing yesterday, and that could be a genuine accident. I think it's very unlikely that an accident happened to kill. You know, in the case of this earlier incident. That it, yeah, no, that's much more convincing. And we know that, that Israel has been assassinated. Well, we know <laughs> nuclear scientists have been assassinated in Iran. We're, um, we're all, I mean, you know, we're, we're, we've been assassinating people right and left. Right. And we're now in a position where anybody we assassinate, we can blame on the Mossad. So, uh, well, also, you know, I mean, also. Don't, don't necessarily assume it's Israel. Also, I know. And also. When, when, when uh, uh, an alleged plot is uncovered that would have assassinated somebody on U.S. soil, we just go, we just freak out. Who would assassinate people on, on foreign soil? What a horrible thing. We do it. Israel does it. You know. Um, and, and, and yet this is used as a sign that, that, I mean, even if you accept that the evidence is compelling, which we won't know until our government actually discloses a little of it, um, the... the, the uh, this is used as reason to attack Iran because they do the kind of thing that um, we and Israel do. Um, well, you, you, we've gotten to the bottom line on this debate, Bob, which is that you're willing to let them have the bomb. I would rather so, I would rather see Iran with a bomb than bomb Iran. That is that is my position. Yes. If you do, if one doesn't buy your position, then one uh, let me say has to I mean with the let me say that if I were there were wait what did you say I should sounds like something I should respond to. No, no, if, I think it becomes a much more difficult debate, and the neocons have a much bigger point if you're not willing to get them, let them have the bomb. Because well, you know, then, then you, you know, may have to come up with an alternative method. Even then, if you really wanted to keep them from getting the bomb through peaceful means, you would have had a very different diplomatic approach than we've in fact had. But Obama's been intimidated by the hawks into more or less giving up on that front. And, and I think he never had an especially enlightened uh, diplomatic uh, policy to begin with. I, I think we've never been good at putting ourselves in the shoes of the Iranians and understanding how they see the world and really um, trying to work something out. I mean, again, you've got to understand that from their point of view, they just, don't, they just don't get it that, you know, Israel just gets nukes and, and nobody says anything and then they're not allowed to have them. And I think if you were Iranian, you would see it the same way. It, it's not, it's not from their point of view, an obviously just policy. Um, do, you do you still buy this, the uh, Steve Clemens point that the the green pro democracy people are even more for getting a nuclear we weapon than the the mullahs? Well, it was in fact the case that when there was something approaching a diplomatic deal. Uh, this is now a couple of years ago, uh, involving I think the offshore processing of the of the uranium. <clears throat> um, that Ahmadinejad and his crowd really wanted to to go with it, and and that it was in fact uh, sabotaged by politically by the people we consider the reformers. Yeah, yeah, it's totally an oversimplification to think that the reformers don't want uh, don't want Iran to you know have the nuclear program they want. Um, I mean, first of all, Iranians are, all, are a very large majority want them to at least be able to process the uranium on their soil, and that's something that a lot of people in the West have a, have a problem with, um, you know, even if ostensibly it's for peaceful uses. Right, right. The, um, we've gone to like a minute and... An hour, an hour and 13. I mean, I'm almost thinking, you know, this would be an excellent occasion to kind of cut the first one off 20, 25 minutes ago, talk 10 more minutes and turn it into two episodes. That's fine, but nobody's going to want to listen to the first one, but okay. That's fine. No, wait, wait, no. Do I mean, I mean, like, cut the first one off after we did a couple of st substantive topics. Oh, okay. Do you, do you want to do the final topic? Yeah, let's do that. Oh. So we'll agree that we'll go back, like, <clears throat> maybe beginning with Iran will be a second dialogue or something. 
We can talk about that after. Okay. We don't have to talk about it in front of everybody. Oh, yeah. Um, no, the, the, uh, I, I was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the, pro I'm always, I get paid by the hit now. I get paid a penny a hit on my website. And so I'm always. A penny, a, a penny a page view? I'm always looking, yes. I'm always looking for things that are going to get a lot of page views for a little effort. And I thought I found one the other day when I noticed in this Washington Post piece that uh, pollsters who, who favor going after the Latino vote, I would say, you know, pandering to the Latino vote, said that not only, not only are Latinos offended by calling uh, illegal aliens illegal aliens, mm -hmm. but you can't even use the formerly PC term undocumented immigrants, mm -hmm. which I thought was the sanitized way because that is somehow condescending and pejorative. Uh, so that leads to a, a, a couple of questions, which is, what can you use? Is there anything? Is there any word that you can use that won't offend people? Uh, and second, why is that? Uh, and uh, I don't quite know the answer to it. I mean, I got a bunch of responses, some from law professors saying they use the words unauthorized instead of undocumented. Unauthorized is a better word than undocumented, but because it's not just a lack of paperwork, it's actually being here illegally. Uh, but uh, but I doubt that unauthorized would pass muster with these pro Latino pollsters either. Well, no, so, I mean I mean they you know this is an interest group that would like uh, the people it's defending to be as described as positively as possible. And you've got to admit that the term they began fighting against illegal aliens is pretty much soaked in neg well, negativity. I mean, first of all, aliens. The first encounter most Americans have with the word aliens is is to refer to creatures from outer space who want to kill them. Okay, so well, it's alien, alien itself. A, alien is the technical legal I word that's been that. around for centuries. My my mother, when she came was an to alien. the United States during World War II, was an enemy alien. She didn't throw a fit. She was an that. enemy she was alien. An enemy Wait, alien. she was an enemy alien. Yeah, she was from Germany. And that was a technical designation. Yeah, I mean, she didn't like it, so I understand why you don't want to be called alien, although, and I understand why you sort of don't want to be called illegal, so you, you but I don't understand why the euphemism you officially come up with uh, to get around that suddenly should become uh, tarnished, except it's like the transition from Negro to colored to black to African American. Every few decades, the term that you're using, the PC term, becomes tarnished because people, you know, it becomes people, you know, feel the same way towards, you know, whatever the term is. Uh, you know, William Raspberry wrote a very good column saying this, so you come up with a new term hoping that that will yeah. cure the problem, and that doesn't cure Tends the not to. I mean, you, it, you know, yet another term. it's the old jan janitor, uh, janitor custodian issue. I mean, you know, kids would say on the playground, oh, you're, you know, your dad's a janitor, you're going to grow up to be a janitor, and so... To start calling and custodians. Soon, custodian becomes the, to mean exactly the well, same as Well, in that case, I'm not sure it does. I don't. I'm not aware of any kids on playground saying you're, you're going to grow up to be a custodian. But anyway, um, but, maybe yeah, that's just because the word never took root. But but this I, is a well-known. Steve Pinker has written about this about how how attempts to escape the stigma associated with certain uh, groups by changing the label tend in the long run not to work because the new labels acquire the old stigma. Right. Well, um, so that's happened. But it's also true that we the, the, the Democrats like to stoke Latino oversensitivity to these things because that's what yeah. keeps them in power. And every, you know, every time, in California certainly, every time, you know, they're constantly saying these Republicans, they don't like brown people. Yeah. I mean, they said that about me. You said that about me. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a way to... to to stop Latinos from looking at what their uh, honest, frankly, at what their honest economic interest is, which might be with the Democrats, but might also be with the Republicans, and to make it purely a, a case of ethnic pride, the Democrats would like to have that it be a, a case of ethnic pride as long as possible, so that Latinos become like blacks, which is that they would never ever vote Republican. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and so we have this whole industry geared to oversensitivity in this regard. Um. Uh, it's. It's even worse than blacks because blacks are sort of a lost cause for Republicans. They don't. The Democrats don't need to keep stoking it, although they do sort of. They they tend to do it, you know, the week before the election, but uh, they don't have to constantly do it because they're not in play anymore. Okay, so wait, is your position that? Um, I thought you had some devastating critique of me. 
Well, first of all, I want to clarify. Your position is that illegal alien... Not hearing it. Illegal alien is a legitimate uh, term to try to evade because it has inherent... Words like illegal... No, I think they're all... But I, I think they're all perfectly acceptable words. I used illegal. I used illegal alien. Undocumented is a particularly bad one because it implies that the only problem is lack of papers. Well, right. And that's why uh, they prefer it. So so in that sense, this is really not like... No, but they don't like it anymore. That's the whole well, point. Well, okay. That, but, that, but I'm trying to get nail you down on which thing you think is defensible. I think they're all fine. Everybody knows what we're talking well, about. Well, no, but illegal Nobody alien... Nobody should be offended by any of them. And this is, this is the difference between janitor and custodian. All of the connotations of janitor come by virtue of its association with the occupation it, in fact, signifies, okay? Whereas illegal and alien are two terms that have negative valence, totally independent of the category of people they're being applied to in this case. So but you, you prefer you prefer wetback, which is very precise. It doesn't have any, <laughs> any extraneous uh, Well, you're right. That is the first. That's exactly about the people it's talking to. Uh, and, and that would be the one word that where I would say that that might be offensive. Okay, that is in the other category, whether where its connotations come, although that has that also, of course, comes from people sneaking across the Rio Grande, so it does it does depict a specific kind of act. But it's overly precise. But 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 anyway, I mean, I guess what I would say is, if you're saying, why are they are they trying to? I guess what I would say is this. Trying to evade the term undocumented immigrant, is that, that's what they're no longer fine with, right? Um, According to this Washington Post article. That does seem to me, by the way, I want to compliment you on your uh, use of the term in, in your blog, where you say that, that it's no longer, this term is no longer acceptable, quote, according to a GOP umbrage expert. That's an excellent phrase. Okay, back to the, uh, the issue. Um, if they're saying that's, no longer acceptable. That does seem to me a janitor custodian thing. In other words, undocumented immigrant are just not things that inherently have very negative, very negative uh, connotations, and they're just trying to maybe they're trying to play the janitor custodian game. There. What, well, by, by a janitor custodian thing, what do you mean? I mean you take a term that has stigma associated with it, but not inherently, only by virtue of its association with the group that is being stigmatized. Okay, it's because people don't respect the kind of work janitors do, and I think they should, but because many people don't, that the word janitor has negative connotations for some people. And it's only by virtue of its connection to the group. Okay, whereas as I just said, illegal alien is different. Those are negative terms. Those are negative terms before they were applied to this group. Okay, now I, what I'm saying is in the case of undocumented immigrant, it does seem to me that that's not in, inherently a set of negative terminology. So so in this case, they are more playing the game of trying to to, yeah. to 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 eliminate stigma by changing a term that only acquired its stigma by virtue of association with the people that the new term will apply to. Okay? I think that's right. So so but but so where I disagree with you is on illegal alien. I think they were right to try. Yeah, I think they also like making Whitey jump through hoops every few decades. Well, that that's that's you know the thing I, I didn't totally understand about moving from, you know, uh, black, black to African, African, American. African American. Not to mention the addition of about thirty-five syllables every time. You know, yeah. I see, but and now there's a move to go off African American to something else. I forget what. Well, you know, when we were young, Mickey, but, the good old days, it was at least Afro American, which was. Shorter, better, but anyway. Um, anyway, you, 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 but, but, but what, what is your my the, the biggest, point is that, my that biggest this is, this issue is a with silly me. exercise, and that we also have well again. These I, I, I think, yeah, I think the, stoking high the latest the latest exercise seems to be like not especially well spent energy. The first exercise, which is to get rid of illegal alien, I get. I I, 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 I I'll get rid of the alien, but not the illegal. Okay, what we call it? Illegal. illegal what? Illegal immigrants. Yeah. Um, or just illegals. Yeah, I mean, you know, knows what you're uh, I don't about. have a big beef with that. Uh, I, I see why. Although I see why they want to shed it, because again, as a matter of PR, illegal has these inherently negative connotations. Uh, what? It's not. You know, nobody's ever driven home the point that they are appealing to people who aren't illegals. Okay. They're appealing to voters. Okay. People who have registered for vote who are here illegally, purely on the basis of ethnic solidarity. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, this is a a straight. I mean, this is a s- s- sort of an odd appeal. You're not appealing to their self-interest. You're appealing to their ethnic pride mm-hmm. in these other people who are breaking the law. It's it's it, it's an unusual and it seems to me suspect appeal. Now, it's true that these you know virtually any Latino family may you know or a, a whole you know, a majority of them may know somebody who is here illegally or have a relative who wants to come here, or, you know, they're, 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 the two communities are intertwined. Mm-hmm. But it's not it's not completely clear to me that you couldn't have an appeal to Latinos who are here legally saying, these people are taking your jobs too. And there is a certain chunk of the Latino community who will buy that argument and override the racial appeal. And I don't think Democrats should be in the business of using racial appeals to override appeals to economic self-interest. Which is what they're doing here. I lost your to train very, of thought. Very briefly. undemocratic sort of appeal to, to to try to revive ethnic bonds at the expense of uh, appeals to economic self-interest. Wait, I lost your train of thought a little. The, the, the racial appeal is what? The racial appeal is you're telling a, a, lo, a low-wage legal Latino worker saying, "Let's let in all these other people who are going to lower your wage because they're also Hispanic and don't you have orgullo and pride in your ethnic heritage and." You know, don't, you know, yeah. as opposed to saying, look, these people are here lowering your wage, let's keep them out. Yeah. Well, if I could eliminate all ethnically based political positions, I, I well, then would you'd be tempted. be condemning the Democratic Party to permanent minority status under, under the reigning Thomas Edsel model. Um, yeah, but it's not nearly as pernicious as, uh, say, people like Newt Gingrich trying to. Um, to stir up animosity toward Muslims broadly, um, that's uh, that, that, and that's on the Republican side. I mean, that's the kind of thing I really worry about. It is is, Did he do is that? people who try to stoke. Oh, sure. Did Gingrich do that? He seems to be more likely to be in the Grover Norquist. Let's suck up. Oh the no! Muslims wrong, 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 wrong. Okay. I mean, um, the uh, no, he's the one who is trying to get a lot of mileage out of the phrase. They're you know stealth jihadists. In America, I mean, that's obviously designed for the consumption of people who kind of like the idea of looking at every Muslim they see with suspicion. But you just said there were stealth jihadists in America. That's the whole reason you were upset about the Iraq war, even if we won, because <laughs> no. it's going to encourage. I think there's stealth like about jihadists. eleven. I mean, and I think, and I think, the more he talks like this, the more there will be. You know. Um, well, so you're in a position like me and 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 Amnesty, which is, it's true, but let's not admit it. No, I mean, I'm willing to describe it. Look, I think when it comes to inter-ethnic tension, any decent American has a responsibility to use language carefully. And another example is that weird embracing of Dinesh D'Souza's argument about how, well, you know, remember when he traced Obama's heritage to what what a Kenyan, so, uh, Obama's ideas to is what Kenyan socialist father, remember that whole thing? Yeah. <clears throat> Same kind of thing. Same kind of thing. Isn't Obama one of the other? You know, um, and, and this is something. That's not what he was saying. No, no, he was no, saying no, but I'm sorry, Nikki. If you're going to, if you're going to talk about the, Obama, has embraced cosmopolitan anti-colonial ideas. And you really think it's because the socialist ideas implanted in him is uh, by his father? I don't think it's because it's in his DNA. And you think it has a damn thing to do out. with Kenya per se? Come on. I mean, if you want to talk about the dangers of ethnic politics, that's fine. But you'll probably agree that the most dangerous form is the kind that stokes uh, tension and conflict between ethnic groups. And I submit that the most dangerous practitioners of that tend to be Republicans, and Newt Gingrich is one of them. I didn't realize that that, that about Gingrich. Well, that's my um, view. I've given you two examples, and you discount one and maybe discount both. But I, I personally think... You know, and he doesn't stop, necessarily stop at this. And the reason Gingrich scares me as a plausible candidate is I think probably none of these candidates are as effective at harnessing resentment and hatred in a destructive way. If you remember back in the 90s when, you know, when he came on the scene, one of his favorite phrases was socialist bureaucrats. Now, that's not an ethnic, that's not an appeal to ethnic hatred. That's an appeal to people to hate government workers. And I think you'll agree, Mickey, that there aren't enough truly socialist bureaucrats in Washington to be worth talking about, right? But he liked that phrase, and he liked it for a reason, because you can stir up hatred with it. And that's the thing Gingrich is really good at, 
and he's a smart guy, and I think he's completely unprincipled, and that's why he scares me. Uh, I didn't know you felt that way. I don't support that, but he, uh, I do give him credit for reforming the welfare system in part by... Well, Mickey, I give techniques. him credit for only divorcing two wives instead of seven, but but let's focus on this one issue. I mean, well, that was the major domestic achievement of the Clinton years. So. What? Only divorcing two wives? No, welfare. No. Oh. Um, a... <laughs> fine, but could we focus on this one thing? Do you think socialist bureaucrats, you know, at a time when we had militias in Montana? training with weapons because they wanted to kill government workers and in fact sometime after Gingrich used that language we had the Oklahoma City bombing do you think it was not kind of spooky to have a person in, with that kind of responsibility talking about socialist bureaucrats would you defend that as somebody who was once a socialist bureaucrat uh, I can't uh, you deny that there's a you were never, truth you were never a bureaucrat and I was I worked at the Federal Trade Commission you're so wrong. And at that time, you were a true socialist? I was some kind of a socialist, yes. Then I met Charlie Peters, and I became less of a socialist. Well, that was... That but when I was a bureaucrat, I was a socialist. I think you'll agree that by 1990, the, the Washington bureaucracy was not rife with socialists. No, it's rife with new class uh, technocrats. Mm -hmm. That would be a more precise word. But I do think... I, I, I agree with you about Gingrich. I, I, I disagree about... Uh, I think the Democrats are. I, mean, I would also point out that I think the Democrats are playing with fire by encouraging Latino racial ultra sensitivity, uh, because it, you know it's 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 it, especially in the case of Latinos, it's not only uh, a, you know a sensitivity to offense. It's also you make an other of, of non Latinos for from the point of view of Latinos. Uh, well, I guess I guess, but can I spell that out the way that works? I, I mean. Well, Latinos are the Latinos, in the, especially in the Southwest, are a special kind of ethnic group. They're not just like, you know, Ethiopians who came here or Irish people who came here, who who would be uh, sensitive to racial slights. Right. They also have a legitimate claim to the land itself, mm -hmm. and that we're the interlopers, and that the border is a, is, a, is an illegitimate border, and you know, and and I don't think I, I think, think anywhere. Close any more than a tiny minority of Latinos mm. actually believe that. Exactly. But exactly. But it's it's it it it, it, it is it, it is there that that group can be grown. Mm -hmm. Well, and it could grow conceivably. Uh, and it's dangerous. It, it's it's not. And, and, a, and a huge number of Latino immigrants just don't see what the fuss about this border is at all. You know, they come here. Everything's in Spanish. You know, the border is some some arbitrary line that was settled in some war long ago. Mm -hmm. Why should that? Why should that affect their life? So I think there's a I large segment of the community that believes that. I just think this is something that alarms you and is not worth worrying about. But um, that's just my view. And you're the one there on the front lines down in Southern California, that's battling right. them on a daily basis. <laughs> um, um, so wait. So okay. So we've got an hour and 32 minutes. But we've agreed that this is actually the second of two dialogues. We've talked about Iran and this illegal immigrant. Should we show it just something? Random, I don't know, Joe Paterno, you name it. You, you mean something we haven't? J just, to, just to diversify the topics of what is now the second dialogue. Sure, throw out a topic. Oh shoot, uh, Paterno's not that bad, uh, but it's a little well, old. Here's the, the Paterno thing. I have the same problem everybody else has, which is why keep the guy on? Who? Unless he, unless Sandusky had something on Paterno. Why would Paterno just not fire him immediately? He did fire him. Paterno was fired in like 1998 after the first investigation. I mean, this is kind of fascinating. I mean, Paterno knew for sure about this guy, I think, right. before, long before the whatever 2004 thing or two, whenever it was. <clears throat> and I think 1998, okay, the mother of one of these kids, the kid comes home and says, uh, this man in the shower lathered me up with soap, hugged me, and said, I'm going to squeeze your guts out. Okay? And right. the mother's like, hmm. She notifies, I think initially, I, I think the Penn U campus police, and I think they notified uh, the other, the, you know, the, the actual police. In any event, there was a, 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 a monitored phone call. The woman calls Sandusky and, does, and says this. He admits he did it and says, I hate, I, I hate myself, I wish I were dead. So it's clear something's going on. 
they, ha they gave it to the prosecutor. The prosecutor in 98 chose not to, 98, 99, chose not to indict, but uh, Sandusky was let go shortly thereafter. He said, Sandusky hasn't been a coach on Penn State for over 10 years? He had a kind of position, but he was no longer a coach. He, he, had, he was on the website as Coach Emeritus or something. And he had locker room access, and that's when, and that was, you know, when it was the locker room access that allowed him to keep doing this, and he had the keys to the locker room. He was no longer on the coaching staff, as I understand it. So the question is, why didn't Paterno take away the keys to the locker room? Yeah. I mean, it seems to be the case that it was because of the first issue that he got let go. Remember, he was the heir apparent to Paterno. So what's the whole fuss about? Well, the fuss, well, the first fuss is, I mean, I mean, there's, there's no fuss about 98 because they actually took it to the police. I mean, the, the Penn campus police, somebody decided to take it to the real police. But whether they didn't have enough evidence or not, the prosecutor chose to not to indict. I mean, interesting, this prosecutor later disappeared, and it's clear that he either committed suicide or staged his own disappearance, but that's another matter. Um, what, what people are upset about is that, you know, in whenever, 2003, 4, one of Paterno's assistants comes, comes up and says, I saw him raping this kid, you know? Right. And Paterno uh, does not go to the police. Now, people say, well, Paterno reported it, you know, to his superior, who is the athletic director. Look, at Penn State... Paterno is the boss of everyone, okay? I mean, right. if Paterno says to the athletic director or the president of the university, I really think we should take this police, it happens immediately. You know, the guy is a god. Um, and, and so, you know, that's what the issue is, is that he clearly had the power to bring this to the attention of authorities. In this case, they had much stronger evidence of actual rape. <clears throat> um, he didn't bring it to the authorities' um, attention, and, and, and subsequently uh, Sandusky continued to get away with it and abuse other kids. That's the scandal. I mean, what they did was they said, well, you know, Paterno needed to be able to say something to the uh, assistant who had reported it to him. He said, right. so he reassured him. He said, well, we've taken away his keys to the locker room, and we've informed the Second Mile Foundation, which was Sandusky's foundation, uh, you know, we've reported this to them. Well, it's his foundation, man. That's like that's like reporting me to my mother or something. I mean, you know. Well, taking away the keys to the locker room is is important. Well, right, but certainly. the point is that if they had reported him to the police, it probably would have blown the whole thing apart this time because they had an eyewitness to rape, and then he wouldn't have subsequently abused right. kids. I mean. So the argument is that Paterno put his friendship with the guy ahead of. Friendship, exactly. well, and his, his probably his fear of what it would look like and how it would reflect on the Penn State program. I mean, my own view is, on the one hand, we shouldn't all be so sanctimonious about what how any of these people uh, reacted to this, because I think most of us, you know, if, if we hear that a friend has done something illegal, it isn't our first instinct to dial 911. Right. And we would like to subsequently convince ourselves that, well, they're going to reform, you know. They probably talk to him and Sandusky says, I wish I could die, I'll try. Right. I mean, David Brooks wrote a good column about this saying, get off your high horse. But at the same time, you know, one reason this is such a scandal is Joe Paterno had implicitly and somewhat explicitly held himself and his football program up as paragons right. of virtue. And, and I think it was a cleaner program than the average program. But... You know, that's why this really struck a chord. You don't think it's also possible that Sandusky had some goods on Paterno? You know, it's not, conceiv it's not inconceivable, because now, I mean, you're at least hearing little things like, well, uh, whenever somebody would try to discipline a student who was a football player just within the campus, Paterno would intervene and get them off the hook. So it may be that in various senses the program wasn't quite as clean as we thought, and Sandusky knew that. I really doubt... I really doubt that Paterno knew about really significant violations going on in the program. But <clears throat> I think it's more about, you know, who wants to see the, the particular burst of publicity 
where uh, uh, somebody associated with your program is suddenly a child molester, right? You want to avoid that. And also, the guy was a friend, and I suspect that's the explanation. Yeah. Well, it's not as bad as I thought. Not as bad for who? Last time we talked about it, it was much worse than I thought. Now it's not as bad as I thought. What, what Paterno did is not as bad as you thought? Yeah. I thought he kept him on as a coach. What do I know? No, he, um, he didn't. I mean, both times he, he did something to, to, to kind of downgrade his his status, but it's certainly true that after that second report, I mean, first of all, that's evidence that the guy's not going to change, you know, because right. it's the second time. After that second report, you know, the, the, the really upstanding thing to do that most of us would not have had the strength of character to do, but most of us aren't Joe Paterno, would have been to report it to the police. Um, okay, I defer to you. Okay. Um, so now we've got enough for a cheese an hour. And You're the judge, Bob. Okay. This is your baby. Yeah, we got we've got two substantial dialogues here. So we should sign off, and then record a brief sign off to the other one. Okay. So thank you for enduring all this. Thank you, Bob. It's been real as always. Yeah. Okay. See you around. See ya.